Let's make a circle. Okay, um, I assume everybody is warmed up, so we're gonna resume, we're gonna do a very quick one uh, afterwards, but first I want to say a, a few words about what we're gonna do, and what is the, the, the system that we're gonna, are gonna, are gonna be explaining. So, Verdadera Destreza is a system that, um, funny enough, has been extremely mystified in regions of the world in Europe in which the Destreza is not, is not practitioned. Everybody's intrigued about what is the mysterious system of the Spaniards this, uh, with circles and, uh, and lines and God knows what. It's like a strange system. And that's funny because if you read the sources, the first author of the Destreza, the user term is Destreza, is Jeronimo Sánchez de Carranza, who wrote his first treatise in around 1560-something. Uh, and then later on, Pacheco and others take over. They make a very, um, a very strong point that what they, do, what they do has nothing to do with mysticism or magic or circles and anything. All they do is apply geometry and body, that's all. And as such, the Stresa aims to be universal because anybody with a basic knowledge of geometry and the body can discover these truths. It's not about this is a secret art that nobody can teach you, and this goes very much what was the tradition of the vulgar tradition. Oh, I'm gonna teach you the secret technique, but of course you have to pay me. The estros and masters of the Estreza have, have nothing of the sort. It's like, this is pure geometry, anybody who is uh, and cultured enough and knows how to do these things can figure out these things by themselves. So the Estreza is not Spanish, it's universal. Because geometry is universal. They base this on Euclides uh, and Greek uh, um, mathematics of the time. Okay, this fell off. So we're gonna introduce a little bit of how this whole thing works and we're gonna start with a little bit of food work. Footwork is, uh, of course, the most fun part of any fencing activity, and it's important to understand how we have this. A good thing of destreza, starting from footwork and starting from everything, is a consistent system. It's a theoretical system that allows us to analyze other systems, to interpret other systems and see what's good in them, what's true, in the sense that it promotes a safe action. Uh, and what is false, a technique that will not work. The Estreza makes a very strong uh, point again of defending oneself. You want to enter a combat and leave the combat alive and unharmed, right? So it's a matter of defending yourself and finding techniques and finding the principles that allow you to defend yourself. Um, for that, we have a consistent terminology about footwork, about body positions, about um, uh, sword positions and distances and, and whatnot that is consistent and was used for uh, 300 years, right in the 19th century. Um, this allows us to analyze other techniques such as Bolognese, or the different Italian schools or German schools, whatever, what it translates. So we're gonna start with footwork, which is the basis. We're gonna do an exercise in pairs to explore this footwork in more, uh, in more detail. And we're going to then do a few exercises of the sort to illuminate how we, we respond. All in all, it's gonna be very similar to Stefan's workshop, so you can compare the two approaches. Of course, uh, our approach is later, by 50, 60 years, so it takes advantage of that. So if you have swords, I want you to leave them on the ground. I'm gonna start with uh, very basic footwork. Footwork is gonna serve as well as a warm-up or a re-warm-up because we already warmed up from the previous workshop. So, the stance that we adopt in, Spani in Spain, in the Destreza, proposes two different stances. It doesn't focus too much on you should stand here, you should stand that, but it, it, f it focuses on two main stances that we find useful. First of all, 
right foot is always forward, uh, unless you're left-handed, and in which case you will switch. So the dominant foot is always forward. And we have two basic positions we switch between. The Bay Española, which is the one that we adopt from outside of range, in which we have the body uh, slightly to the lower, uh, to the rear. The arm is extended and the sword, uh, uh, and, and the sword arm is extended and the um, left or uh, non-arm so, uh, arm is resting here. Elbow goes inside and we stand more or less in this position. This is the distance we adopt when we move from afar. But more commonly when we enter, we adopt a higher stance a higher stance in which we are basically standing, almost standing, not completely standing relaxed, but standing in an aggressive way and we're moving like this. Okay, gonna do a little bit back and forth and gonna explain the footwork just to get used, straight back, arms inside, and we go a little bit back and forth, yep. just to get used to this particular position. You'll notice a few things. Uh, your arm may get tired. Yes, that can happen. So in order to avoid that, you have to work with both shoulders. The elbow has to be inside, not outside. Keep it inside. And you're actually moving the left shoulder as well, or the opposite shoulder, just to move the body the balance. You're not moving the sword back and forth with the arm. This is exhausting. You're moving the body. Okay. Good enough. Good enough. Okay, let's add a little bit more precision to this footwork as we have it. In, in the Destreza the system, we have three types of foot depending on the length, depending on how far we go. We have the length of the foot and the direction in which it moves. The length of the foot is simple. It's simply, uh, we can move with the forward foot first, and that's a simple step. Simple, right? I'm going in the direction of movement, that's it. And I can also go backwards, and then I initiate movement with the rear foot. Back, forward, back, forward, back, 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 forward, boring. That's simple. Yes, so far, back and forth. We also have the passata or double step in which the rear foot passes in front and then changes. So basically, almost like walking, the important thing here is that we don't move forward the left uh, or the, um, the non-armed shoulder, yeah? We don't walk like this. We tend to keep the, the sword forward, so we leave the shoulders as they are and pass. And moving backwards is the same movement. In this case, initiates with the front foot first, backwards, Forward, backwards and forward, backwards and forward. This is the step that covers the more, the more distance. And we can use it for thrusting, we can use it for retreating and changing. One advantage that we're moving two feet and double step, we can change our minds. I'm entering, no, maybe not. I'm retreating, but not too much. Yeah? This is the double step. And finally, we have the half step. The half step is similar to the passata or the double step, but it comes behind, behind our foot and it becomes a very short movement. Something I want to do. Why don't do, why do this and not a very short front step? Well, because this gives us the possibility of changing direction easy. Yeah, here I move, that's fine, but here, I will be able to change direction. And same when we move backwards. Yeah. So, 
to summarize the footwork, simple step. The first foot to move is the one in the closest to the direction of movement. So we're going forward, in my case, the right foot, backward, left foot. If I'm doing passata or half step, the first one is opposite to the direction of movement. Left foot, left foot, so going forward, back foot, back foot, so going backwards. Simple, right? No complication, no mystical, no nothing strange. Okay, but of course, we don't just move in a straight line because we don't like the straight line. The straight line is bad. I'm gonna explain that why later. We move sideways. So we have a couple of ways, three ways of moving sideways. Um, the diagonal distance. So if my opponent is standing right in front of me, say there, I can move diagonally to my opponent. That means I'm not moving forward following this black line that unites us, but stepping away. And I can do that with a diagonal step, a simple step, with a full step, with a half step. And same to the other position. One, two, or more commonly, three. <coughs> simple, right? Again, it's diagonal. We're gonna do this a lot because we want to move away from the sword. We can explain this better when we have swords and an opponent. But it's just a diagonal step, transversal in Spanish, transversal, diagonal will do. Okay, so we have this way, we have this way, and of course we combine. I can take a simple step forward, diagonal full step uh, to, the, to the left, simple uh, full step backwards, diagonal, simple, to the right, etc., etc. With this system, I can tell you exactly where you should be. Two, two step forwards, three step backwards, in which direction, how long, etc., etc. To complement that, we also have measures from the central line, so how many steps should be away from the central line. We're not gonna get there because then we can spend the whole workshop in this and that would be boring. But that's it. That's, uh, that's not all. We also have, we have done the diagonal steps. We also have the curved steps. Diagonal steps are such, and I'm gonna need Martin. Please stand there, don't move, just be a mannequin. Yeah. Diagonal steps are such that the, pos the relative positions of my shoulders are parallel to the line in which I was. Yeah. But I can also take a curved step in which I orient my body to my opponent. Yes? Can you please show passing step to the right? Passing step to the right, it goes a little bit awkward here and then go. Passing step to the right needs to be profiled and go like this. And then I am projected like this. The version of that that does curve is very similar, but then I am projecting to my opponent. And that will have certain uses. For example, the disarm that we're gonna see usually makes use of a diagonal and then a curve. It's another step, thank you. It's another step that we can take. We have uh, diagonals and curved steps. We also have, and I'm gonna say that those for the sake of completion, uh, steps on the what's called the infinite line, completely lateral. So if the blue line is perpendicular to the line in which my opponent is, I can also walk this way. And this way. This is a step that increases distance. Yeah, if you remember your mathematics school, what I end up here is with a hypotenuse, which is longer than the uh, cateto that we have here. Yeah, so it's, it's a step that increases distance, of course, if my opponent stands. And this is something I will use if they don't. Okay, they move here, I can escape. And the last one is the mixed step that goes backward and forward in one direction and in the other. This is, I'm gonna just describe the directions. So we have forward, two versions 
around the, around the sides, perpendicular to our opponent, mixed and backwards. We covered everything. Yes, simple enough. I have to say another thing in terms of the circles. Oh, the magical circles. In, in the Stretta, we define mainly two circles that are of interest. We have more. We have the main circle around myself, which is where I pivot. Important thing is the maximum circle, which is the circle that my sword describes at maximum reach. This is the maximum circle. It's used as a reference. It's not like I'm, I'm going to do spinning actions, but it's a distance in which I need to, please, I need to penetrate my opponent. This is where the game changes. It is used as a reference. If he's extended like this, if I'm walking in certain directions and I am outside that circle, that tip is a danger. I have to deal with that tip. If I have penetrated that circle and I'm inside that measure, that tip is no longer a danger. Yes? He needs to do, he needs to retrieve it, and I'm much closer to do this, this action. It's a completely different game. We use this as a reference to know where are we inside that circle or outside that circle. It's just maximum circle out. I need to deal with the tip first and foremost. And here I need to deal with cuts and other actions. And I'm in a range for a different kind of thing. That is the maximum circle. In addition to that, there is the common circle. And this is what we're gonna be working in a moment. The, if we define the distance, I'm gonna explain what is this later. This is the distance in which we should start. Imagine there is a circle with the center somewhere in the, between us and connect our feet together in such a way that if he stands there and I walk that circle, I will end up here. How do you do? Right? This is the distance I want to be covering with my movement. I'm walking this circle. I'm no longer in the same distance. And I'm entering to search lines in this part of the body. Okay, so we're gonna be moving, when you see moving in this circle or in this circle, searching for openings. That is the most common thing we're gonna do. Outside of range, we're gonna come inside and once we are crossing the maximum circle, we're gonna walk this way or we're gonna walk this way. One last thing regarding movement, we're gonna do an exercise in pairs, is the positions of the shoulders. Positions of the shoulders, you should be profile. The natural stance, neutral stance, the beginning stance is somewhat diagonal. We're not square with the shoulder describing a line perpendicular to our opponent. We are not completely profiled, but we're diagonal, but we switch. So when I move to my opponent's sword side, I need to be square because that increases my strength when I move. And I have my uh, the body my body is on the right uh, on the left side of my sword so here i am protected all these lines are behind the plane of my sword imagine here there is a shield that a wall that forms here my body is on this side and i'm carrying this with my square when i'm moving towards the uh, other side moving towards my right side i need to be profiled I need to be profiled. If I'm here, I'm offering prime targets for him to disengage and hit me. That's not good, I have to be here. And moving in this direction is tricky. Moving in this direction is tricky, especially with a sword. So let's do it. Let's do a few exercise in footwork. In pairs, I want you to do an exercise that's gonna be basically as follows. We call it making circles. So from here, I'm gonna be moving and he maintains distance. So he basically has to mimic my movement, but not necessarily the same footwork, just a general direction. So if I'm moving here, he's moving in this direction, here, here. If I'm closing in, he has to retreat. If I'm retreating, has to advance. One person lead, one person follows. Give time, don't, don't necessarily walk too fast, give you time to think about the movement. And when you do so, especially when you move into the sides, keep a good uh, eye for your own shoulders. 
So when you're moving, um, no, sorry. So when you're moving to the short side, to your right side, if you're right-handed, you are profiling. When profiling, one last thing, be careful not to overdo it. Don't overdo it. Uh, the stress is all about the medios or the middles. Not too much of this, not too much of that. Yeah, so if you overdo it, bad. If you don't do it, bad. In the middle is the virtue. Okay, so in pairs, any other observations? Yeah? No? When you do lots of long scores, it looks like a baby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is essentially one sided long sword in, in many aspects. It's just here, here, here. You never change, but otherwise, it's very similar. Yep. Okay, um, good, so we've done a lot of, a uh, bit of fourth work, we've done a little bit of positioning. Let's uh, grab swords as well. Some exercise or you want No, we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna introduce a few more things. Don't no, not yet. Not yet. Sorry? Don't wait too early. Yes. Okay. So, um, of course, the stressor is very much associated with the cup hilt rapier of later centuries, but in the early days, 1600, they were still using this kind of sword. And the typology you see in the Pacheco 1600 is exactly this kind of sword. Um, it's just that, of course, as we'll explain, some modifications need to be done. Or we're going back in time, so some modifications have to be done respect to the cup hilt modification that we're done later. How do we grab the sword? The Spanish system proposes two fingers to inside the ring, not one, for increased control, yeah? Two fingers inside, and then we switch between three versions, three grips, three ways of holding the sword. It's, it's, the grip, as always, should never be too strong because your hand will get tired. Sorry, I explained how you should not do it should be relatively gentle. And we have three ways, as I said, of holding the grip. What we call the middle grip. The middle grip is such that the pommel rests under our wrist. Yes? And you hold the sword like this. That makes it easy. You can even re uh, leave your grip. I'm, as you see, I'm almost not holding it. And the pommel is under my hand. And the sword stays. Yeah, of course I'm not gonna be like this, but it's a, sh it's a way of showing that your sword stays there. And that is kind of the standard middle grip that we have most of the cases. No. Uh, the other we will switch, the most common, is the inner grip. The inner grip, this is an exaggeration, the pommel comes inside the wrist, usually something like this. I'm, I'm showing here exaggerated, but this is an exaggeration, usually something like this. And this is what we will use for thrusts, because it's the one that gives us the maximum reach, here or here, yeah. The inner grip. And, yes, I can thrust in the other direction. Yes. This is the inner grip, because the pommel is inside your wrist. And finally, we have the outer grip the one in which the pommel is outside of our hand. This we used in mainly two situations when we go with a thrust in this, uh, in this stance, or to hold the sword, control a sword like this. This is the strongest grip that we can have, and the inner grip is the weakest, 
but it's also the shortest range. You cannot really thrust. The, 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 the sword forms inevitably an angle with your arm. But most of the time we're gonna have the middle grip and we're gonna switch to the, to the uh, to, for thrusting or to, uh, to the outer grip for thrusting from the outside or the inner grip for thrusting from the inside. Let's do a little bit of movement with that. Focus on the footwork with a simple step forward with thrust, simple backwards. Move with the footwork we, you, you want. I'll leave you free choice and just get used to the familiarize that. Yep. Switch, so when you thrust, middle inner grip, retreat back to middle grip and out to outer grip. Back to middle grip, thrust with inner grip, etc. So you are switching, switching, switching. This should be easier with two fingers in the ricasso because you have a very good control here. With one, it becomes a little bit more awkward because you don't control the sword as well. Yeah. Change the line if you go in the outer. Um, uh, you don't. From, yes. From yes. You. If you were to do that like this, you don't. Yes. But you will switch to the outer grip. How does? Uh, yeah. So you will have and, the and pommel this. here. You leave it slide. Yeah. From here. See. From here. To this. Ah, okay. So yes. there is a movement. Okay. There is a movement. From this to this, this to this, this to this, this to this. And similar from here to here, to here to here. With a slight rotation, there are rotations. Rotation of the hand, rotation inside or outside. That's how we change grips. Our last thing in terms of but the nation, we don't have this system of prima, seconda, terza, quarta, none of that shit. We focus on the fingernails. If I have my sword gripped, and I didn't have my glove, but you imagine where my fingernails are, this are fingernails on the inside. Yes, yeah, it's stupid, I know, but it's how we call it. Fingernails on the inside. Fingernails down. Fingernails up. We don't really have fingernails out because we don't use this, but we could. And we call fingernails half up or fingernails half down. And these two positions, this and this, are the two main positions that we will adopt for thrusting. So when we thrust, usually standard thrust, we thrust with fingernails half up, or if it's thrusting from the outside, fingernails half down. Yeah, we can also use fingernails inside in certain occasions, and fingernails up, but rarely. And we're gonna explain those when we reach that point. So, thrusting again, Changing the grip to the inner grip and thrusting half, uh, uh, fingernails half up. Yeah. Terza and quarta would be something like this. Okay. Good. Well, we are at it and we seem to be thrusting, thrusting, thrusting. Let's discuss a little bit about the thrusts that we will do. Destreza talks about five different ways in which you can wound an opponent and five different ways only with variations, but those are five different ways. The thrust and four different kinds of cuts. Four different kinds of cuts, the circular, Tajo, the circular reverse, or 
aprovation. The half Tahoe and the half reverse. End of story. There are variations, of course, the Tahoe can come diagonal, can come vertical, or the reverso can come vertical or diagonal. Yes? They are not ascending cuts. They, in the sense that this, they are very much disliked. And there are no hits with the false edge. We don't hit with the false edge. So this exercise we've done before of this, not in, not in Spain. We have a similar solution and we're gonna see how that is. Okay, so those are the four. But before we get to there, let me just explain positions of the sword. Right angle, the famous right angle, obtuse angle or high angle and low angle. This is the, this of course reach less and this is the angle that we will be adopting. In general, our stance with the sword from Bay Española just here with obtuse angle, closing the lines here from outside, and then I come reach something uh, close to this. Now, if this was a cup hill rapier, I can be very happy doing this position here, yeah? because I have a cup hill. That, that's great, that's fantastic. But if I do this with a side sword, he will stab my hands. Damn it. So I have to have this control from a little bit obtuse angle. And I cannot just present my sword except when I'm going and I'm placing it to thrust, when I have passed his tip, when I have penetrated the maximum circle. So I'm outside, that's when I start from this position. And once I've entered, now is where I can extend safely and search for the lines. Yeah, I cannot just do this kind of action here because then I will get stabbed. I have to be controlling from outside, from outside, from outside, and then when I'm entering, immediately switch to thrust. The thrust is very much point oriented. The thrust is still the main, and the cutting actions come as a secondary, as a secondary action, as a second intention action. You, I never start an action like this because well, I'm stopping here. It's extremely dangerous. Um, the distance in which we start is, is the distance in which my tip crosses, uh, touches his guard. Of course, if the swords are equal or more or less equal. Yes. From this distance, I cannot be extended yet, and I will be entering the action. Um, let's do, I'm gonna do an exercise of thrusting. I'm gonna do a very simple thrust in which our opponent is more or less presenting the sword. And I'm not gonna search for his hand, I'm gonna search for his body. I'm not gonna thrust with a simple step forward because that tip is very much entering into me. So what I will do is simple step diagonal to the line. So bound from the inside, step, and I'm moving his sword away to search for his line in the neck. Very simple action. I'm starting from here, entering, controlling, lifting my, my guard, lifting my guard at the same time I take a simple step forward. And I aim for the neck or the shoulder, basically what we call the collateral line of the right or of the sword, our opponent might be left-handed. If our opponent is left-handed, I would do the same kind of action moving the sword aside. I'm moving his sword aside so that it doesn't present a threat. I'm controlling it with the kilon and ending. I can control with the kilon half up or vertical, or what we call uh, uh, fingernails inside, thrusting here. Yeah? Let's do this one in pairs. So to recap, exercise, standing from outside guard, taking a step and searching for the lines here. It's not, it, uh, what I want you to do and the aim of the exercise is to practice the movement to the side. And I invite you to do two versions with the simple step 
and with the uh, passata, with the double step here. Yeah, you will see that there are slightly differences. Get on with it. This is extraordinarily simple, right? It's very simple, and yet this is, in any fencing, the hardest part. Because this is what illustrates a lot of different things of how you position your sword, how you position your arm, how you position your body when you thrust. Things to consider when you thrust, for example, to this side is how do you position your sword. Your sword was to be in a position in which is the strongest when you, when you, when you strike. Why is it stronger? Why is it weaker? If you have the flat exposed like this, where is your pommel? It's outside of your wrist, which means that pushing it down is extremely easy. You come like this, I will push down, and then my sword will go like this, and you can disarm me, which is not what I wanted to do when I set to stab you. Well, it's not my intention to give you a sword. Similarly, if I go and strike like this, my wrist is not really capable of pushing hard when you're pressing this way, yeah? So I will lose it. Instead, I extend my sword from the middle grip and only at the end, free it. Tiny little difference, tiny little difference, but makes the difference, sorry again, between hitting and being disarmed. Um, I haven't mentioned the measures of strength. This is an important element as well. May I have a volunteer? In the Estreza, we calculate the swords in degrees of strength. From the weakest, we call, assign that the number one, to the strongest, 10. Including the shoulder, it will be 14. Uh, so basically, how it, he may be stronger than me. He probably is, physically, I mean. But if I have higher degrees of strength, I'm using stronger measure. Of course, I'm stronger than him. We know this. We all have done long sword at some point. We all know these things. Stronger, weaker. But we need to know exactly where, yeah? So in order to strike him, I cannot just strike him positioning my weak and advancing with my weak through his strong because then uh, bad things will happen, bad things for me, good things for him. So I need to advance in such a way that I am lifting my sword and gaining through, uh, through his weak, so I have position eight degrees of strength over his three, and I can enter here or here. I need to go through that. So I need to do this subtle movement of lifting. And I, if he lifts the guard, I can search low. If he doesn't, I can search for the neck. If we don't do this, if we just go like this, it's a matter of strength. Mm -hmm. So there's another element there that we need to be taking care of, another subtle uh, thing of this. Um, good. We've done the very simple strike, and here you can attack on one side or another, up or down, depending on where it's defending. Let's do another, and we will start with the responses, attacking from the other position. And this is, again, an exercise in footwork, in which what you will do is, again, lift, but walk through the sword side, through, uh, through your sword side, the body of your opponent, and strike him in the chest. Yeah, you search for the openings in this position and you walk this way. This is hard because you kind of, you kind of have to walk backwards. You do so, step backwards and profile yourself to search for the lines here. Yep. You get it? Let's do it from the other side. So from here, I search for the lines. Here. Notice that I'm walking in a circle. I'm taking a circle a step, but eventually if I continue this circle, I will end up here. If I walk 
main, in, walking in the maximum circle, maximum distance, I will never come close. I will just be orbiting. <laughs> and that goes us nowhere. Yeah, that gets us nowhere. I need to be walking in such a way that I am circling him, so I'm facing him all the time, and closing distance. Please don't fall. <laughs> okay, any questions so far? Good? Mm, yep. Seeing a combat action, it's a, about footwork. Yes, we don't necessarily advance like this to our opponent. What I'm trying to get you to do is moving in this direction while moving the footwork, the, the sword at the same time. Yeah, because you will be moving this way and then changing directions. That it's not like you do this, but it's a way of forcing. A thing that is very important is that you should always be behind your sword. Your sword, especially the guard of your sword, should be the shield that protects you from your opponent. The grip should almost always, not always, but almost always be between you and your opponent. That means that actions in which you take the sword outside here or here or are very much not recommended, except in the very end. Yes, yeah, sure, if I have the sword stabbing like this and I'm uh, uh, disarming, that's fine. But in general, we want to avoid that. Martin, please. And we use this in reference, uh, uh, I always say that the sword is usually the point of reference. The sword is many times more right than you are. What do I mean? This. The sword is in where it should be. It's controlling the opponent, it's aiming at him, it's controlling the situation. I'm not. Yeah, that can disengage. So the sword is where it should be. So I'm gonna leave the sword in place, and this is what I should be. Now he disengages, I am behind my sword and defending myself. So the sword is usually the reference. We have an intuition of where a sword should be more often than we have of where our body should be, which is strange. We were born with a body, we were not born with a sword, yet the sword is, comes, how, comes more intuitive. So I, mean, I don't need, I cannot do this action, it's very risky, because as, as before he does that, uh, my line of attack is outside his sword, and his line of attack is closer to mine. It's also outside my sword, but it's closer to uh, uh, the line that connects us, the diameter line. I need to go that way, and before I reach there, he will hit me. Not good. I need to move my sword on par with my body here. In this situation, my body, my own diameter line, is in line and his is not. So from here, I could advance and stab him. So I need to move my sword with my body. Same when I move to the outside. I need to move my sword with my body. If I move my sword first, kaput. Oh, that's a German word. Yep. I am very much dead. I need to move my sword with my body. And this is the difficult part of this exercise of walking. To walk always behind your sword. Uh, we're going to continue this exercise. Please pay attention on this. But also, we can introduce, because we yeah, have lack of time, the main defense against this thing. For this is better we have also masks. But in general, he tries to do this thrust from the inside here. And stab me. And there. Am I resigned to die like that? No, I have a number of different defenses. From here, I can take him and do atajo, blocking. So when I'm doing this, this is the most important defense. I'm positioning my sword above his. Let's do it very, very slow so I can illustrate how I do this. Lifting my sword to gain a little bit of strength and then switching with my body motion, not with my arm only because it's weak but with my whole body, 
to control this. I'm taking, I could take a diagonal step with my, with a simple foot, so my sword foot, or with the other one to control. And then from here, I add pressure, searching for the line, or go for the disarm if I have the chance. Again. I am coming behind my sword again. If I do this, he will cut me or stop me. Yeah. So defense like that, just like this, come and search for the lines here. We have other options, especially if we are slow in this action. I can cut. And the cut, in this case is a reversal cut, it has to be aimed in such a way that it's blocking the sword and thrust it at the same time. If I just go for the, yeah, hey, no, uh, no, bad. Yep, that's one action we're gonna do. Uh, and finally, we have the disengagement. I cannot disengage from here safely. Uh, 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 no. I have to disengage with a step backwards and then in it. Doesn't aim to hit him aims to not be hit and still be in the game. So if he comes in, okay, and see it, disengage and search for the lines there, maybe search for the hand. So preferably, in you know, our preference, atajo, if that got you by surprise, cutting, if that still catches you by surprise and you don't know how to do it, disengage and threaten. This engagement has to be done with a B movement. Leave it, and then with the middle grip, threaten the lower lines there. Lower, sorry, lower or higher, your choice. Okay, put on masks for safety. So explain how to do the cavazione or the disengagement because it's very easy. Uh, and but sometimes, many times I see it very confusing, applies any kind of pressure there enough. Uh, my, my engagement should be just like uh, your choice of, of letter, a V action or a U action, but basically with the sword in the same position. Yeah, I lower my tip and that's all I need to do. It's very simple, it's very simple. Please avoid any weird twists to the arm that take time and make it slow and don't really advance anything. If I twist it like this, I will be too slow. I don't need to do anything like this. This is enough, simple. Okay, in addition to that, uh, let's work on the standard action. This idea that we had before of lifting makes certain sense, especially when I don't see what's going on. I, he's attacking, I am distracted because I'm looking at something. Oh, and I need to retreat to prone position. I don't have the time to retreat and do this action. I'm not sure what he's doing, in other words. I need to retreat. It's just that instead of going like this, because then he could press an attack and then I have to rely on me going down, which may or may not work. We don't like to do that. Instead, what we do is we threaten with the right angle. So, it comes like that and strikes, I come like this. It's not meant to stab. I mean, if he comes extremely aggressively, yes, sure. But that's basically on, on, on my opponent. It's the opponent who is getting stabbed because runs into a sharp, into a, into a tip. All I do is, I don't see what's going on, okay, I retreat. And this is far enough. If he comes close, I retreat. I consider whether I want to take a, a step back or not. And I don't remain in that position. I immediately, because then my hand is exposed. I'm not staying like this to let him strike. It's just stop here and back into guard. This is the most basic defensive action. It doesn't get you anywhere but safe. Yeah? It's not what I would recommend first because then you have to restart again. Okay, I cannot do this indefinitely because eventually I'm gonna run out of space. 
but it's a good defensive measure when I want to reconsider. And it's very similar. I can do it with a half step of regaining my feet equally as we did before. And from here, I can continue moving backward. I can move to the side. I can return forward with a passata, with a full step if it's needed. Yeah. So again, from here, I can do it. This is a simple retreat to distance, to safety. Yeah. I want you to incorporate into the exercise uh, you're doing before. So we're doing, I put pressure and I go for a thrust like this. And if you don't like what I'm doing, just retreat. And it's just a matter of extending the sword. So from here, you don't need, sorry, you don't even need to do a cavazione. Because just by retreating, you are retrieving your sword. He, his, your sword will naturally disengage itself by increasing the distance. Yes? So that's one additional tool I want you to add to the repertoire of the exercise you will be doing. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the cuts. We have short time, but I want to talk a little bit about the cuts. I said that we don't do cuts uh, as a first intention action. I should never be starting from here and do a cutting action because it's short. A circular movement, this kind of movement, is shorter than a line. It's, it's longer than a line, it takes more uh, time. So it requires two movements, up, down, and back to the center, instead of a thrust that requires just one. So we don't like to use them as a first intention action, but it's all right when we do as a second intention action. We've seen uh, what can we do when he applies pressure, which is a reversal. If he applies pressure to the other side, I can do a, a cutting action to this side. And it's pretty similar, I need to walk away. The cutting actions, like this, he tries to go this way, left. I always make the same uh, stupid joke when I do this, what time is it? Time to cut. I lift my hand, so I defend that attack with a, um, with a, lower point, lifting my guard, and then I come attacking towards the uh, left side in which my opponent is attacking. Very simple. If you've done Saber, it's the same thing. If you do Bolognese, it's the same thing. Yeah, but we do the action here and cut. And we need to move away. We need to move away because it's it's what we call an instantaneous wound. Hits on a moment, but I'm not controlling my opponent. I need to get out. I can get out by going, continuing the movement, or by stepping out. Either way, I need to step away. So let's do an, another one of this in this exercise. I apply pressure because I want to stop him. So, and he does the action like this. Let's get on with it. Finally, we're gonna do how to defend against these cuts, and then we will be over. How was it with the cuts? Cutting cuts, all good, all good, easy, simple? Yeah, very simple like actions. You can just choose whether it's vertical, whether it's diagonal, whether it's one way or another. We also have, we don't have much time to cover them, the half cuts. Uh, I'm going to just mention them, you know, in a second because I wanted to do something else, but I'm going to mention them anyway. So the circular tajo, the circular cut, comes into this direction. Where will be the half cut go? The other side. The half cut is this action. This is a full cut and this is a half cut. If I do a, a full cut, I'm walking this way, of course, and pressure that my opponent puts me, blah, blah, blah. If I take a half cut, I'm walking this way, I'm doing this. Why? Okay. I know, that's not good. I have to cut in this sense. So both actions are similar in the ending. Both end up 
who is marking your opponent diagonally or vertically from the right side. But one, since it initiates with a movement of um, um, Movimento violento y remiso, with a movement which is downwards and to the outside, pushing the sword outside, allows you to travel this distance safely. When you're doing this, you don't have that movement. So if I here abandon the sword to go cut him, I get stabbed. No, what I will do this is in general from the outside, binding and cutting. The action, ending action is the same, but I'm walking in the other distance. So you do the falso after all? Yes, yeah, but I do the falso, I don't cut with the falso. I use the false edge. I have a I have false edge, I can use it. Yeah. I just don't cut with it. <laughs> it's for other jobs. Similarly, we have the false, uh, the reverso, uh, uh, or the, why is speaking Italian? El revés. Come this way and walk this path. But if I do that with a half reverse, I'm going to walk this path. So they are crossed. Yes, this comes in handy to do this kind of action. Push the sword, come to thrust me, push the sword and cut. And that happens very well. But I wanted to talk about defense against the dark arts, uh, against the cuts. And we have very way, many ways of doing cuts. So if I prompt my opponent to do me a cut on this side, how can I defend those? Uh, in general, we dislike direct parries because direct parries require two movements or two tempi to do parry and do something else. What if we could do the lazy? Everything in one go. Yeah? Thrust. Thrust on this side. It requires me to walk. As you may have noticed we walk a lot. Uh, prompt, thrust. If I don't see it coming, yes, I can block and thrust. But then things like this can happen. I can miss him and then he can cut me. Not good. So I have to be very careful. Fire with the forte and then strike him in the neck. If it really comes too late, I can parry here. And this, if I've done this correctly with the body usually behind, I can disarm or I can thrust. Yeah, but that is kind of a last minute moment action. Uh, I can give you the prompt. Boom. Uh, doesn't need to be cutting. You don't need to defeat your opponent. If you have disarmed him, you can be kind enough to let him a chance to surrender because we're gentlemen, we're not murderers. Okay, so those are three main self-defense. To recap, thrust and get away. You cannot stay here. Ha ha ha, no, uh, no, no. You need to get away. Second, parry and thrust. And third, parry here and thrust. This is essential as saber, parry. It's kind of the same principle. If you, and you have to, it's difficult because you have to time it properly. The time is when the movement, the downward movements have start, has started. If he sees me party, this, ha 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 ha, uh, no. not good. So I have to party at the moment in which he's coming down. So I have to time my movement right when I see his movement coming down. We don't come tempi, we can movement. What is he, what is he doing? Uh, for the reverso, reverso, for the reverse, we have a similar action, boom, which is one of my favorites. This comes very nicely, fingernails up, 
So uh, 35 in such a way, theoretical it is, with, mid, uh, with outer, uh, with inner grip, so I control his soul when it's coming. Uh, it's important that this only parries the blade when I'm stabbing, yeah? If I just come like this, it will be swiping me. So I have to enter. The moment I see, it's half quarter circle and aim for the neck, aim for the chest. Another one I like a lot, parry and disarm. You always have the choice of parry and disarm. This requires you to take a curved step when it's coming, have the sword, your guard low, so you are coming close to his guard, close to your opponent's guard, while keeping yours away. So from here, I can take a step and disarm. Yep, to recap, here, thrust, with a, dia with a diagonal step, I personally prefer the passata for this action doesn't have doesn't have to be. This will work equally well. And find end the party like this. And now we've seen something interesting, which is how we prompt an adversary. So say we're here, la 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 la, and I initiate action like this. I tease my opponent into doing a cutting action. If he does a cutting action, I have him control. He can do something else. For example, he can disengage. Okay, then I have something else. We haven't covered that part yet. But if he comes with a cutting action, I'm defended. If he retreats, that's another story. But I can already see that, and this is one of the aims of the stress, is to have a system to program the opponent. I come, I threaten, he disengages, boom. He, he does, he forms a cut, okay. Uh, I come from the other side, threaten, he comes, cuts, okay, fine. I know from my action that my opponent has a two, two, three good things he can do. And I am prepared for them. I know that because at every moment in time, I am in defended position. I navigate from safe position to safe position. Of course, that is the art, that is the theory. Then it's a matter of how you can actually implement this. Yes? So for the final, uh, well, if we have two minutes, we have two minutes, we can do a little bit of this exercise in which threaten, action, threaten, action, counter, atajo, et cetera, et cetera. I think that will be all. I hope you had a little glimpse of what the strata is. We could, of course, not cover many, 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 many of the basics uh, that uh, that make the strata, of course. Uh, but I hope this was some of somewhat interest to you. You notice that it's not that much different from what you already know. It's not some mystical, uh, legendary bag of secrets that will make you masters of everything. It's not, it's just a system that has a consistent set of names and that uses certain things. Uh, use it, uh, I think it's useful, but you judge yourselves. Uh, um, I will remain during lunch and slightly after. If you have any questions, follow-ups or clarifications, I'll be happy to. And you can always reach me uh, later on online um, if you have any further inquiries. Lastly, I'm told that the lunch will be prepared in five minutes, so I'm literally the guy standing between you and lunch. <laughs> so we'll keep this brief. Thank you very much for coming, and uh, hope you're good.